Hello, I'm Bethany Rooney, television director and author. How did you get your start in the entertainment industry? I grew up in Ohio. I went to college at Bowling Green State University, which is not a, a world-renowned film school by any means. Uh, but I worked at the public TV station, and through that met a, a student who was three years ahead of me. She wrote a great, must have been great, fan letter to Mary Tyler Moore. Because of that, she got a job in the accounting department at MTM. Three years later, I'm getting my master's. I'm still working at the PBS station. Her name was Michelle Gallery. She came back to work on a documentary on the TV station. I know this is a long story, but here's the punchline. I said, Michelle, I'm coming out to California. Can I call you? She said, of course, and by then she'd moved from the accounting department at MTM to now she was a story editor on a show called Lou Grant. So I arrived in California on a Friday. On Monday I had an interview at MTM. Wednesday a secretary quit. And I started the following Monday as a secretary to Bruce Paltrow and Mark Tinker on a show called The White Shadow. This is a very long time ago. Um, and I typed all the scripts and I answered all the phones and Actually, the first half season of uh, The White Shadow, there were only six people in the office. That's how I learned the business. And then Bruce and Mark gave me an opportunity to move up to associate producer when they created a show called St. Elsewhere. That was in the mid-'80s. And um, in season four of that, I began directing. And here we are. And I've, I'm coming up on, I'm somewhere around 200 episodes of primetime network television as a director and nine TV movies. There you have it. What was it about directing that initially grabbed your interest? I think directing calls for, on, for the person to have so many skill sets, and that's interesting to me because no day is the same, no hour is the same, no piece of footage is the same, no actor is the same, no producer is the same, it requires a lot of political skills, a lot of storytelling skills, a lot of sensitivity, a lot of tenacity, a lot of courage, um, a lot of physical stamina to be able to do it. Uh, I just think I looked around at all the possibilities of what a person could be and went, that I think would fit me the best. Although, I have to say, at the time, there were hardly any women directors. so. Uh, it was pretty gutsy of me, I think, but I had the support of Bruce Paltrow and that's what allowed me to move forward. When you receive a script, what are the first steps in your process as a director? The first thing I do is read the script, start to finish, as if I'm reading a book. And the goal is, in the finished product, to match that, what, what is created on digital instead of film, uh, to my imagination the first time that I read it. Because that's the first time it's going to be new to me. And my goal is to make it new to the audience. And that's what they're hiring for me for, really, is my imagination. How did I see it the first time that I read it? Um, so I closet myself away and imagine as I'm reading. And then I begin the process of taking all the steps that will make that come true. There's a lot of prep to be done. Um, in addition to my own work of blocking and shot listing, there's all the meetings with all of the department heads in terms of um, what is required for each department to bring to this party. What are the wardrobe? What are the production design? What is the, um, what, are, what are kind of props am I looking for? What are the locations? All of that work gets done in seven prep days. And at the end of that time, we're all moving in the same direction based on my vision, which is, uh, you know, um, in episodic television, my vision is the vision of the show with just my little, little bits and pieces put on that. Um, so at the end of the prep, and we're ready to start day one of shooting my episode, every element is in place, including my own work, blocking and shot listing and understanding what story I'm telling, which is the most important thing of all, so that when I go in to direct and 
elicit performance from actors and talk about what shots they're going to be. It all is in service of telling the story. Do you have any favorite shows for which you have directed? The tricky part about that is that if I come onto a show with not a huge amount of respect for it, thinking, oh, this is just, you know, commercial television, by the time I begin shooting there, or at the end of the first day, let's say, I think it's the best thing on television because I have to embrace it a thousand percent in order to give of myself. And so every show I've done, I love. And when people ask me what my favorite show is, I say whatever I'm working on right now. Um, interestingly, the last two things that I worked on and will air, you know, sort of back to back in the next couple of weeks, um, are, couldn't be more different. One is an episode of Pretty Little Liars, and one is an episode of a TNT show called Murder in the First. So we have, you know, um, <laughs> young women trying to solve a solve murder mysteries and being a little um, beautiful as they run around trying to do that. And it's a high school show, too. And then on the other hand, we have this murder mystery drama from Stephen Bochco that's very intense and very cold and very complicated. And both of those shows I was able to embrace and love and care for and give my best to. In answer to your question, really in the last few years, my favorite shows to do were Scandal, Parenthood, and Nashville. What is your process for working with the actors, from the series regulars to the guest stars and co-stars? I introduce myself to the regular actors, the cast regulars, before I begin shooting, just to say, hello, how are you? I'm new to you, you're new to me, but we're going to have this wonderful time working together. And oftentimes there's an opportunity, and I say, do you have any thoughts, any questions that we can explore ahead of time? And it allows the actor to see if I'm on the same page as he or she. Um, I hope that there is a table read for the show that I'm about to do because that helps too. To see the, the um, arc of the show and of each character and watch the actors in the table read. But if there isn't, on we go. Um, you know, every actor wants to know that they're safe. They want to know that this strange person who's coming in to direct this episode uh, will, won't make them look stupid. I won't ask them to do something that goes against their instincts. I will ask them to raise their game to the absolute best of their ability, and they can trust my judgment. So what will happen is, in order for them to have that feeling of being safe, they're going to test me on the first day that I work with them um, by questioning my judgment um, or in, in whatever way they choose to do it. It'll be subtle, but it will be there. And I would hope and I believe that most of the time, 99% of the time, what the actor gets out of that is, yes, I can trust this director. After that, it is just a loving, funny, energetic process of telling the story that we're all engaged in together. Um, I love, love, love what I do. I know they love what they do, so, you know, there's lots of hugs all around and joy in telling the story together. Do you have any specific language or terminology that you use when working with an actor on set? Yes. My acting teacher was Gordon Hunt. He was, he still teaches to this day. Um, he, it was a scene study class. I mean, you know, I took classes in college and all of that. Um, but he started me on the road of looking at acting as intention and obstacle, um, of achieving something, of, um, you know, so often um, people talk about intention in a different way. He would talk about it in terms of what you need to accomplish is to get the other person in the scene to do something, to take an action with a verb. Um, so often that's what I'm talking about to my actors on set. And then through the years, I've developed a whole vocabulary um, that oftentimes it was the actors teaching me. If I was attempting to say something and they would translate it in their own mind and say, 
oh, you want me to play the obstacle. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I want, yeah. Um, and you, so eventually, my, my goal is to say what I'm looking for in as few words as possible. I don't need to give them a whole lot of crap about where their character has just been and, you know, what the weather is and blah, blah, blah. I should be able to say in one phrase what I would like them to do. And I find that that works really well because I don't need to tell them how to do it. That's the actor's craft. What I need to tell them is what I am looking for. The studio system fostered certain qualities in actors of that time. What do you wish actors of today were aware of from the studio system legacy? I wish the old studio systems were in place, to be honest. I wish actors got um, lessons that instructed them to have better posture. I wish actors had vocal lessons so they don't mumble because the, they mumble. Um, I wish they had um, what we what in the old days I think was called deportment classes, meaning how to interact with other people. Um, it's kind of a basic um, wish that we were more as a as a people, as a nation, as a business, that we had more etiquette, that we had more manners, that we had more sense of pride, that we stood up tall and put our shoulders back. And um, this is making me sound really old and really traditional. But what I find so often is that young actors particularly don't have a lot of respect for the craft or for themselves. And so they happen to have some talent, so they kind of slouch their way in and mumble their way through it. And um, I just think we could all do better. Do you have any tips for actors to help them give the best performance and not be cut out in the editing process? Talk faster. Think faster. Think and talk, not think then talk. And talk faster, because it's almost always about pace. And I understand that an actor is sort of waiting to feel it and then deliver it. And that that thing will get cut out because the general overall consensus is that the American audience needs to have things moving quick, quick, quickly. And so what, whatever the actor does that feels um, indulgent to the actor's process will be cut out. What advice could you share with a young director who was looking to work in television? It's incredibly difficult, really hard, um, for a young or emerging director to get into television. For one thing, the financial stakes are so high, and, and yet there's less time and there's less resources. And so um, studios and networks and showrunners would be taking a huge risk to hire a director who has less experience. So that's really hard. However, there's a new awareness of how difficult it's been and how few people are getting in. And so the by DGA contract this year just happened as of July 1st. Uh, every studio has to have a diversity program where they invite um, women and people of color, for the most part, to um, come into their closed shop to, to get behind the scenes to hopefully take classes because film school is great, but film school is not how we do episodic television. So you need to learn what that process and what that structure is. Um, so all of the studios and networks are embarking on this idea with the new awareness that we need to get new directors in. I hope it has an effect. I hope um, the doors have been closed for a really, really long time. So I hope they're opening now. How can a young director get an opportunity to begin directing for television? The business has always been about who you know. If it's, you know, your second cousin's best friend's girlfriend, it doesn't matter how far away it is. It just needs the personal touch of somebody calling somebody and saying, could you meet this person? And people in the business are really good about that because everybody understands that's how it works. In terms of shadowing, often now you can, a young director can get into a program by a studio or network and get assigned to shows to shadow. 
But if that doesn't happen, you just work every connection that you have to get yourself on a set. And yes, you need a shadow. And yes, it's great if you have a mentor. But that's a tricky thing too because, for example, if someone asked me to be their, their mentor, if I connect with them, I'd be happy to say yes. But the fact is I don't have the ability to hire. So I can't be thoroughly effective as a mentor. So that's tricky. What a, what a mentor is mostly, I think, is um, someone who understands how the business works and understands the process of directing and can help show the way. But in terms of getting the job, you know, you need the agent, you need the manager, you need to meet with studio and network executives, you need to have a piece of material that shows you off well as a director or many pieces of material. And no one has an excuse anymore for not having a short or a small film. Um, all of those elements need to be in place. And then on top of that, you really have to have a personality that you have to be a salesman of yourself and sell yourself to them. Why should they give you the opportunity? Why should they pick you over the thousands of people who already exist who do the job? It's really difficult. As a director, is it difficult to adapt to the different genres as you work show to show? It's not difficult for me to adapt because that's what I do. I'm a chameleon of storytelling. It's not my job to upset the apple cart of a show. It's my job to fit in seamlessly. It's my job to tell the story in the same um, method and visual sense as they have always told the story. But it's going to be different because it's me. If you give 20 different directors the same scene, you're going to have 20 different scenes. You, every other element can be the same, but if the director is different, it, the scene will be different. Um, however, my job is to mesh, and so I watch previous episodes. If, if there are some, I read all the scripts leading up to mine. If that is impossible, very often I end up doing episode number two after the pilot because um, I'm good and I'm fast and I'm on budget and um, it's a really backhanded compliment to me like, okay, we spent all this money and time on the pilot, now we're let's get down to business. I do that episode often, so there isn't anything to watch except the pilot sometimes. So then I talk as much as I can to the showrunner, to the writer, to learn how they see it in their minds, what's important to them. And then I tell the story the best I can with my own visual sense. Do you have any interest in directing half-hour sitcoms? It's a different beast, you know, in sitcom land. Um, shots are not particularly visual. There's a formula for doing it. There's a formula for interacting with the showrunner slash writer. There's that whole audience element. Um, it's, it's not the same thing. I tried it um, in the first year of my career as a freelancer. I went, uh, no. Because what I do as a single camera film director in drama, and of course there's no single camera anymore, we always have two or three, but we call it still single camera, um, I do exactly the same process as any feature director does. Steven Spielberg and I, Clint Eastwood and I, whoever you want to name, we're in the same process. They may have a better vision than I do, they may be more creative than I, they certainly have more money to work with and more time, but the process is exactly the same, and that's what I love. Do you sit in on the edit sessions for your episodes? Once I finish shooting, uh, usually the editor has a couple of days, and then by union contract, by DGA contract, I have four days in editing. It, unless we're facing an air date that's coming up quickly, that happens mostly toward the end of the season, in which case I might have a little less time. It's just, you know, it takes two months to make an episode and they air once a week. So when you get to the end, it's a big crush. Um, yes, I go to editing. Yes, I love editing. Yes, it's the chance for me to tell my story in the most specific way possible and to present it to the producers to say, here's my gift to you. Now, generally, um, it'll be a little bit over in time. You know, um, if running time is 42 minutes and 30 seconds, 
um, depending on the script, it could be anywhere from and how each show likes to do it. It could be on time. It could be 30 seconds long. It could be two minutes long. If I work for Shonda Rhimes, which I love to do, it could be 10 to 12 minutes long because that's how she likes to do it. Um, so a lot of what the producers do after I turn it over is just to take the time out. Um, I would never in a million years give up that opportunity, which is guaranteed to me by the Directors Guild, to finish my process by going into editing. Can you talk a bit about the struggles you faced as a female director in Hollywood? I've been really lucky in that I was at the right place at the right time. There was a movement in the middle, late 80s to get women in. And that door opened for a tiny little bit and then closed again. But I got in. It was difficult mainly because there were no role models for me. The role models that I had, the first director that I ever saw on The White Shadow who made a huge impression on me was this lovely man named Jackie Cooper who was had started in the business as a child actor in the late 30s. And by the time I'm talking about in late 70s, early 80s, he was a very accomplished and renowned television director. And he was a cowboy. He wore cowboy boots. He smoked a huge cigar. He cussed a blue streak. And he shouted a lot. And that was my example of what a good TV director was. So then there were many others. But they were all men, right? So when it was time for me to direct, I thought you had to be like that. You had to be loud and you had to be tough and confrontational and all of those things. And it took me a really long time to learn on my own without anyone to tell me that the best thing to do would be to use the best of myself, even though that wasn't the standard procedure for directors in television. So eventually, <laughs> I got it, finally, that um, the, the way for me to use myself is to do what I believe in, which is to be loving, which is to be kind, which is to be supportive, which is to be mothering, which is to be clear and concise and strong and, um, and a, a good decision maker. That's all those things make for a good director. Be eventually, I got around to that. Eventually, I went, oh, huh. And it feels so much better, too, to do it the way that works best for me. Um, to this day, I think we are, I think the numbers are, and I should know this because I'm co-chair of the Women's Steering Committee of the Directors Guild, I think the number is 16% um, of episodic television directors are women. So still to this day, we are a very distinct minority. But I do believe that the business has learned that you can be loving and still be strong and that's not held against us. Do you keep up to date with new technology? And how does it change your process as a director? I don't keep up on it at all. It doesn't matter to the least. A director still d directs in the same way that a director directed in 1939. Or in my opinion, should. That is. I don't sit at Video Village. I'm on set with the actors. and. Um, therefore, I am just like Alfred Hitchcock in that way. Um, in terms of the technology of the cameras and everything else, all I do is say action and cut. I don't have I don't have to know how to run the camera or how anything works. I don't know how to edit. I know what I want to see, but I don't know which buttons to push. Um, I don't really recommend that to anybody. I think what when you start at the bottom and work your way up. It's such a better way to um, understand what everyone brings to the party. But I did. You know, I started as a secretary and worked my way up, and technology came after. Um, I, as long as the process is the same, as long as I'm telling a story by virtue of performance and shot, that's what I have to stay up on. That's what I have to stay current with. Technology, that's for everybody else. Do you encounter any problems when directing a show outside the Los Angeles market? There have been times in the past where I can think of one in particular where I was in Toronto and there were 20 productions in Toronto right then and we had were scraping the bottom of the barrel for crew 
um, and that was difficult. But now, any production center, for the most part, is going to be several several crews deep, at least. And generally, you know, you bring the DP and the first AD with you. Um, so I don't find it challenging. And you can get any equipment. You know, if I say I need some, you know, special kind of crane or something, nobody box. They order it in from LA or wherever they need to get it from. And I would say the biggest challenge is co-star parts and small parts because those are going to be cast locally. And sometimes I wish the caliber was higher or they had more training because, you know, that just makes it tough. That's the biggest challenge. As a television director, what is your process behind finding your next directing job? My process of getting jobs would be different than an emerging director just because of how many people I've worked for and how long I've done it. My process is my agent calls and says, somebody want to know if you're available. You're available. So do you want to do this show? Yes. Because I have a family, because I'm a mom and a wife, I try to stay in town as much as I can, but with so little production happening here, um, sometimes that doesn't happen. Some years I go out of town every other month. And you have to understand it's for almost a month at a time to do an episode. Sometimes I'm really lucky and get to stay in town mostly. Um, but in the past bunch of years, I've shot a fair amount in Atlanta, a fair amount in Vancouver, fair amount in Albuquerque, um, and then a few other places as well. Um, my only real criteria is, am I available, and is it a show that I think I'm a good fit with? Because I've learned. <laughs> It's not a good idea to take a show that I'm not a good fit with, that I don't, that I can't embrace the material wholeheartedly. Can you tell us about your book, Directors Tell the Story? So often I would come onto a show and the cast and the crew, once they got to know me, would say, pull me aside, you know, over coffee and say, you wouldn't believe what the last director did or didn't do. In other words, how they badly did the job. And I heard it so often. And I began to feel slightly offended because here I am trying to do a good job, but I'm tarred with the same brush because I'm a freelance episodic director. And the people surrounding me, the, the director before me and the director after me, aren't doing it well. And primarily that was because they came from other areas. They were an editor who got the shot to direct or a writer or an actor or a DP. And they thought, well, I've been on set all this time. I can direct, sure, I can direct, and didn't understand that there is a craft to it that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of understanding and a lot of learning. So after I you know, was hurt and offended for quite a long time, I thought, well, what can I do about that? I can write down everything I know. And I'm a good person to do that because I have done it for so long and have so many hours under my belt. And that, that would have been where it ended. But then I met Mary Lou Belli, who actually shadowed me on a show. And that's, we became friends. And she had previously written two textbooks about acting. And I said to her, I would really like to help. I would like to give back by showing in a book how it's done. And she agreed to do it with me. And we were great partners in that regard. So. Though she comes primarily from multi-camera, at the time she had only directed one hour of single camera, um, she knew uh, what a textbook requires and what elements are needed and had a good sense of structure and a lot of understanding about acting because, you know, of all the directing she had done. So we came together to write this book. It's called Directors Tell the Story, which that is the essential thing that we do. Um, and it's in use in a lot of film schools. And right now, I use it. I'm the teacher. I should come up with a better word for the Warner Brothers Directors Workshop. So I use our book as the textbook and teach emerging directors. Right now, we have 12 people in the class for 2014. And I teach them how to do it well. And then, in the Warner Brothers program, they get a directing job on an, an episode of television. And I feel good about that. I feel like I'm sending them out with 
my instructions of how I think it should be done, and very much in an old Hollywood way in the sense that I say, please don't sit at Video Village. Please be on the set. Please don't shout at actors. Please go and talk to them gently, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I give them my, my method, and I hope it makes a difference as um, storytelling goes forward in the future. Any last bits of advice for the young actors and directors? To actors who want to work with me, I say, come on, come in, let's have fun. Um, bring your best. I'll bring mine, and together we'll do something really great. To directors who want to be in my shoes, um, I know I am so blessed, and I am so grateful. And I know that they would be the same if they were lucky enough, blessed enough to get the opportunities that I've had. And I would just say, Embrace it, love it, give it your all. Um, I see so many directors today who don't prep, who don't put the effort in, who sort of wing it. And I feel like that's not giving your best. That's, some people are really good at it and maybe that is their best. But I think most people, most directors would do better to really put the work in ahead of time. Imagine the show figure out what the shots would be, understand the story you're telling, um, be fully, fully prepared, because only when you're fully prepared can you walk on set and let the magic happen. Thank you for joining me today. I hope all of this was really helpful, and I wish you all the best.